So yesterday we did uh, PCA. Um, who did not finish the PCA exercise? Okay, so there are still quite a lot who did not. So what, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to continue my lecture and then afterwards we'll have plenty of time to uh, you know, finish those PCA exercises or then do uh, DMIX PCA, which I'm going to talk about now. Okay. Now, once you've finished the PCA exercise, um, <coughs> you should basically have results that look a little bit like this. Okay. So here you have uh, time. This is the projection of the first principal component. And the different colors correspond to the different task conditions. So color in this case is actually uh, frequency F1. And then you also see dashed versus solid. And that is the decision of the monkey. So whether you know, F1 was larger than F2 or not. Okay? And that is the type of plot that you should get out of the PCA exercise. Okay? So you see. And so the question is, what did you learn from this, basically? Okay? What did we learn? So there's some things that we can see that, you know, at least to us, were a bit surprising the very first time we did this. One of the things you see is that if you look at the first principal component, you see that all of the different task conditions just overlap perfectly. Okay? So it has very little information about either the first stimulus frequency F1, about the decision of the monkey. It is completely independent of what was happening in that particular task. It's just locked to the rhythm of the task. And interestingly, you know, the second principal component is similarly very much influenced just by the rhythm of the task. And in fact, um, what you'll also see is that most of the variance in the data is actually explained by these two principal components. So that there's a lot of activity that is just related, you know, to the timing of the task. And so I think it's an open question, you know, why that is the case. Okay? One possibility is always that, you know, from the monkey's point of view, there are many other things going on that the experimenter maybe did not monitor. Okay? And then these are reflections of that. So imagine, for instance, just to make something up, that the monkey synchronizes uh, its breathing to the task. Okay, and there, there's a reflection of that, say, in the prefrontal cortex. Then, for instance, you would expect to see some kind of rhythmic activity. Okay, and there could be other things, like maybe it's tapping his foot or having other somatosensory experiences doing the task. Okay, um, what you see here are the weights of the, uh, of the uh, princip principal components onto the neurons. So it's basically the, if you look at the eigenvector, so the axis in space, and you just plot the distribution of coefficients in that eigenvector. Okay? And that's basically what you see here. So it tells you, you know, how these principal components are distributed in the population. And one of the interesting things you see is that essentially every neuron is more or less a random combination of these principal components. Okay? Like even if you look uh, with clustering methods, etc., you don't really find any kind of different classes of neurons in, the, in this particular task in the prefrontal cortex. So there's no class of neurons that cares about the stimulus frequency F1 or a class of neurons that only cares about the decision. Everything is just, you know, very distributed. And that is something that you don't just find in this data set. I think you find it in many data sets, okay? Um, and there's also sort of characteristic shape to these distributions. They look, if you look at them more closely, you see that they look like exponential on both sides. So that would be called a Laplacian distribution, for instance. Now, why that is the case, I would say no one actually knows. Okay? But again, it's kind of curious that it happens not just in this data set, but it happens in many data sets, that you always find this type of distribution of the eigenvector coefficients. <coughs> and so to ask, what did we learn? I think it's useful to compare this against the classical analysis that I explained yesterday that was just making computation uh, population averages. So remember that yesterday what we did is we kind of, you know, checked each neuron for frequency tuning or we checked each neuron for decision tuning and then we got this class of neurons that were like significantly frequency tuned or the class of neurons that was significantly decision tuned and we just took an average. And so this is what you get. And so I think one of the things you learn from principal component analysis 
is that there's a lot more going on in the population. Not least that you have these strong components that are just related to the rhythm of the task. Okay? And that in many respects, this simplified picture gives you like the wrong picture of what is going on in um, the data. Okay? Now, because it does, it misses a lot of what's going on. So here's, uh, who asked the question by the way? Okay. Right. So I have, a, I have a specific view of why it is the wrong picture. Because when I was a postdoc with Carlos Brody, where for the very first time, you know, encountered this data, before I actually analyzed the data, Renul for Romo and Carlos, etc., had analyzed the data a lot. And sort of from this perspective, you know, that there are classes of neurons. And so we developed a little model, just a two neuron model, basically to explain this task, just a little dynamical model. Um, and it could very, it could sort of reproduce, you know, these types of components. And then we kind of knew that there was other stuff going on in the data, okay, that didn't entirely agree with the model. So I got very curious and uh, decided to run PCA on the data. And when I saw this, I was extremely frustrated because, you know, all this, like our model would basically reproduce something like PC5, okay? And all the other stuff, you know, didn't occur in our model at all. So in that sense, I had the feeling, you know, um, with this type of analysis, with this classical analysis, we kind of cheated ourselves into a very simplified view of what was going on in the PFC. And then if you come from a theory perspective and you try to model something, you know, if you don't know what the data is, you're not going to model the right thing, okay? So that's why, you know, I like to emphasize, first, you really have to understand what's in the data. You have to have sort of a representative picture of the data before you can make any kind of uh, reasonable model choices. Then you can still decide that you ignore this stuff, but at least you know that you ignored it, okay? So it's from that perspective that I say, you know, it didn't give us the right picture of what's going on in the data. Despite the fact, which is correct, that there's also some dynamics there. That's true. Um, <coughs> Still, still, I have to say though that you know after seeing these components, that didn't really make me very happy either, because it's not like you look at these six components and then you say, okay, now that makes total sense. Okay, for me it was totally nonsensical, basically. Still is a bit nonsensical, and uh, so one of the things I tried to do back then is to kind of say, well, you know. These are six components. There are six coordinates in the space. It's really a six-dimensional subspace. And it's really a question of visualizing what is going on in the six-dimensional subspace. This is one particular projection of the data, of the six-dimensional data, onto six axes. But you could choose any other type of six axes. Okay? They will no longer be ordered by the amount of variance, but they may sort of give you a different picture of the data. And each of these pictures may be, you know, interesting in its in its own sense okay and so if you do that if you kind of like you know mess around with those six dimensions and try to find different coordinate systems in that six dimensional subspace then what you can see at some point is that you can actually separate out coordinates that are only responsible for the decision and those that are only responsible for the stimulus okay that was sort of an interesting thing to see that actually decision and stimulus even though they're pretty mixed here Right, so you have, you know, there's stimulus information here, and then there's decision information here in the third principal component. In the sixth principal component, you have a bit of stimulus information, a bit of decision information. Same in the fifth principal component. So it's similar to what we saw on the single neuron level, that like the principal components basically show this kind of mixed selectivity. They care about the stimulus frequency. They care about the decision. Okay, but there is no, you know, I care only about the stimulus. I care only about the decision. But if you play around with this coordinate system, you actually see you can find a coordinate system like that. And that triggered the idea of like developing a method that would do it automatically. Not that I really cared about doing that, but I noticed very quickly that if you're in a talk and you tell people I messed around with the coordinate system and sort of rotate it around, it doesn't make them very happy. Okay? So that then led to the development of what we call DMIX principal component analysis, and that's what I'm going to explain now. So let's look at this whole idea of, uh, you know, dimensionality reduction again. So we've basically said that you have the, the state space of neural firing rates, will be the firing rate of neuron 1, neuron 2, neuron 3, 
And we kind of imagine that, you know, as the activity in the prefrontal cortex evolves, you know, you trace out some type of trajectory in that state space. And uh, yesterday evening, we saw a lot of nice examples of that. Now, if you have many of those trajectories, you can say that basically these trajectories span um, some type of subspace. Or if you want to be more fancy, you would say a manifold, because subspace is usually assumed to be sort of linear and flat, and manifold can also be curved. Okay? So you could imagine that you, know, you have many trajectories, and they generally lie on some type of lower dimensional manifold or subspace. Yeah? And then the question that you may want to ask is, well, you know, that's kind of cool that they are in this lower dimensional subspace, and that's what we saw in, uh, with principal component analysis, but is there any meaning to the subspace? And what do I mean with meaning? Imagine, for instance, that specific movements on this manifold would correspond to specific parameters of the task. So imagine that if you were to move in this direction on the manifold, then that would correspond to the stimulus that the monkey is experiencing changing, and only to the stimulus. But if, for instance, you move in the orthogonal direction, okay, in this direction, then the thing that changes is the decision of the monkey. Okay? So now it's not just any coordinate system on that manifold, but it's a very specific coordinate system where different coordinates correspond to different things that the monkey experiences or does. Okay? So in this case, it's got to be stimulus and decision, but then it turns out there are many things that you can basically separate in these sort of different directions. And one way of understanding what such a direction is, is to see it as a, as a linear readout from the population. Because each direction is the linear weighted sum of the firing rates. And what you want to do with this linear weighted sum is extract information about, say, one of the variables in your task, such as the stimulus or the decision. Okay? So let's, let's say that's actually what was going on in areas such as the prefrontal cortex and maybe other areas. So then what you would really want to know is you would want to find this coordinate system, not the principal co uh, component coordinate system. Okay? Because principal component just orders your axes by the amount of variance in the data, but that would not be super informative. You would want to know something about, you know, which directions correspond to the stimulus, to the decision, to the reward, whatever else is going on in the task. First, I want to point out that not just PCA, but actually many of these dimensionality reduction approaches are sort of based on this idea that, you know, you take the neural activities of your neurons and then you project it down but a projection, you know, intuitively can also be understood as just a linear readout, a linear weighted combination of your firing rates, which is a way of reading out information. And so um, what you end up with is, from these neural activities, a bunch of traces that are these linear readouts or the components. And what we ideally want, just to show that graphically in a different way, is to go from these neural activities that are very mixed with respect to the task parameters two activities uh, to these readouts that are no longer mixed. So that you have a readout that, you know, only carries information about the stimulus, only carries some information about the decision, etc. Yeah? That's basically what we want. But that's only goal number one, because that in some sense is only decoding. Goal number two is we want to be representative of what's going on in the data. Okay? And that again is like, I guess, my perspective as a theorist I'm not happy if someone tells me, well, I could decode the information um, because then I don't know, you know, well, was there other stuff in that data? Okay, is that everything that was in the data? And so to understand that, we're going to impose, just as in principal component, that from these readouts, you can actually reconstruct the total neural activity. Okay, so that is what we do that is PCA-like in some sense. We ask to generate a bottleneck that allows us to compress the data in a, in a way that we can totally reconstruct the data, but we want the compression to be in such a way that it relates to the task parameters that we care about when we design the task. And another way of, of uh, saying why that is maybe a good thing to want to reconstruct everything is to say, well, you know, if the brain fired a spike, it was probably for a reason, so every spike matters, and we don't want to throw away 90% of the spikes in a way of just interpreting what we're interested in, but we want to account for everything. And so I think I, s I had the paper uh, posted somewhere, or I, I sent it to Martin, so I think 
people may have uh, had access to it, but there's uh, this paper, Deem Experience of Component Analysis, from eLife 2016, that basically explains the method uh, in detail. But I'll give you some of the uh, core intuitions now. So here's the core intuition of how you can find these readouts that reconstruct everything and only care about certain parameters. So we'll do it in a very, very simple toy example. So imagine that you had a, a task where there are three stimuli, okay? And those three stimuli care, uh, evolve over time and you record the firing rate of, say, two neurons. So here you have stimulus one, and you see that both neurons' firing rate changes. Here you have stimulus two, both neurons' firing rate changes, and this is stimulus three. And there are basically five time points here, okay? And what we're trying to uh, demix here is just the stimulus against time, okay? I would have liked to show you a stimulus decision in time, but it get we get into dimensionality problems, so that's why we have to work with a simple two-dimensional example. So let's first look at some classical methods and how they work. So one method that we haven't had, but that is very classical, is called linear discriminant analysis. What linear discriminant analysis tries to do is find a projection of the data that separates the stimuli as much as possible. Okay? And visually, you can sort of see that this is a really good axis. So this would be the axis for linear discriminant analysis, or LDA. If you project the firing rates onto this axis, then you see you know, stimulus 1 falls here, stimulus 2 falls here in the middle, stimulus 3 falls here, and they're nicely separated along this axis. Okay? So that's an axis that nicely separates the three stimuli. Okay? However, um, it's not an axis that allows you to reconstruct the data very well. Okay? Part of the reason is that if you think about the data, you may, s you may have noticed that stimulus 1 and stimulus 2 are very close together, and stimulus 3 is out here. Okay, so stimulus 3 is very separate. However, on this LDA axis, they're all sort of equally spaced. So you obviously lost information by using this particular axis. And that is a general statement about decoding. Whenever you decode information, you know, there's always the danger that you lose a lot of uh, the information. Okay, if you decode one bit of information, you may lose the rest of the information. Okay, and that's basically illustrated here. So you lost the fact that stimulus 3 was out there. And in turn, that means you cannot really reconstruct the data very well. Okay? So LDA basically allows you to separate the three stimuli, but it's not representative of what was going on in the data. PCA, on the other hand, which we had, is different. PCA really allows you to reconstruct the data. So here you have the PCA axis for this example. And if you now project all these points on the PCA axis, you can already see that you know, on this axis, the points are very close to the original data points. Okay? So you're very representative of the original data points. But there's a downside, and the downside is you failed to actually discriminate those three stimuli. Because while well, stimulus 3 is clearly up here, so it's very separate, but now stimulus 1 and stimulus 2 kind of overlap. So if you were now to look at this uh, projected uh, component, then you would basically see you know, there's a lot of uh, mixture here between stimulus 1 and stimulus 2 in some sense. Okay. So the question is, can we sort of do the best of both worlds, both try to decode something and try to be representative of the data? And so the key idea is that you change things a little bit in such a way that you find some kind of compromise between these two conflicting goals. So here, for instance, I'm showing you now the way we decode it with a DPCA decoder axis. So this axis is a compromise. On the one hand, you know, it still allows you to separate those three stimuli. On the other hand, you can see that the red stimuli stimulus is now out here, and the blue and green stimulus are uh, up there. Now you may say, oh, but you know, these guys are very far away from the red points. So how did we you know, reconstruct this properly? But it turns out that PCA makes a very specific assumption between the step of projecting down and the step of, you know, moving back up into the uh, original uh, space. And because both of these steps are totally related, okay? But you can loosen that. You can say, I take one linear mapping to project down, and then I take another linear mapping to project back up, okay? And that is visually illustrated by just saying, well, this was the DPCA decoder axis, okay? And then what we're going to do is, we're now going to find another axis, so another linear mapping, that allows us to sort of reconstruct the original data. 
except we're not trying to just reconstruct everything, because at this point we only care about the stimulus. So all we'll try to reconstruct are the means, the mean of the three stimuli. Okay, so here you had these three stimuli, one, two, three, and the firing rate. So we're going to take the mean firing rate for each stimulus, and that's going to be the target of what we're going to try to reconstruct. And then you have a different axis, which we call the encoder axis, which maps you from that 1D subspace back to the neurons. And then this is the axis along which you encode the information. And now the distance measure that you have is the difference between this mean and these different points. Okay? So that's explanation one to give some intuition about what uh, DMIX principal component analysis uh, does. And I'll give another explanation in a second. First, I want to point out a little bit uh, how this works mathematically. So mathematically, what we do is we change the PCA loss function in that we don't try to reconstruct the full data. We will eventually, okay? But in this single step, we don't quite yet. In this single step, we only try to reconstruct these stimulus means here, the mean firing rates for the three stimuli. And we call these marginalized averages, okay? So these are these three different points and they sit in this matrix. Then we take the original activities, put them through the decoder and the encoder. Okay, so these are the two linear mappings, similar as in PCA, except they can be two different linear mappings. They don't have to be the same linear mapping. Okay? Um, and then we take this difference and minimize it. And that can be done mathematically through a method called reduced rank regression, where x are the uh, regressors and xs is what you're trying to predict. And reduced rank regression is a nice method because it has a, a simple solution, okay, through singular value decomposition. So there's no tricky business. You know that you always find the best solution. Yes, exactly. Yes, uh -huh. exactly. And here's an uh, ah, and then I promised that we in the end we're going to reconstruct the full data. So far, we only reconstructed the stimulus averages. And we do that by decomposing the data into marginalized averages. That's a decomposition that actually existed in the statistical literature before. So it's part of the MANOVA literature. They also decompose the data like this. So basically what we do is we take the data x. So these would be these uh, 15 points here for the three different stimuli over time. And then we first average over the three stimuli. If we average over the three stimuli, we just get the average profile over time. Okay? So that would be this particular uh, trajectory. Then we add the stimulus means, so the firing rate means for the three stimuli. This is the uh, blue, green, and red point here. And then there will be some kind of remainder term, which in this case we just call noise, that basically tells you a little bit what you couldn't get to this particular decomposition. And the interesting thing about this decomposition is that it's actually unique. Okay, it's unique. You can go from here to here and vice versa. From these three things, you go back to here. So the way in DPCA the reconstruction works is that we do basically separate DMIX principal component analysis, if you want, on these three marginalized averages, and we try to reconstruct those three marginalized averages through three different sets of uh, axes. And then afterwards, you can add those, and you get back the original data as much as possible. Okay? So the actual loss function then turns out to be this one. So you have the loss, you try to go from the data x over the decoders for time and the encoder for time towards the uh, marginalized average for time. You go from the original data over the decoder for stimulus, encoder for stimulus, to the marginalized average for stimulus, and then the same for the remaining remainder term, the noise. Okay? And so that's what we call uh, demixed PCA. And here's another way of looking at the algorithm that goes more step by step in what you're actually going to do. So imagine that you have a single neuron, and this is its PSTH, the way we computed it yesterday afternoon. So here you have time, this is the firing rate, and this is in fact a PSTH from Renulfo Romo's data. Okay, so the colors are F1, solid and dashed lines are the decisions. What we're going to do is we're going to take this PSTH and we're going to decompose it into these marginalized averages. And that works in the following way. So first we just take the overall average. That's what we did yesterday when we centered the data. Okay, you computed the overall average. The overall average is just a number, so it is illustrated here as a flat line, but it's really just a number. The overall average firing rate of this neuron. Then you can subtract that number, and you can average the firing rate at each time point. 
Okay, so at each time point here, say at time two, you actually have 12 lines for the six stimuli and the two decisions. So you just take the average of those 12 points, okay? And then if you do that for the different time points, then what you get is what we call the condition independent part because we averaged out all task conditions. But as you see in these individual neurons, there's still some, some kind of rhythmic activity left in some sense, right? Here you see that the neuron fired more during the first and during the second stimulus, for instance. Then you can subtract that. And then what you get uh, is that you can now average out the decision. Okay, so we go again through this uh, uh, PSDH after we subtracted those these two terms, and then we just now average out the decision. So there are only two uh, decisions in this case, so we just average them out. Okay, so for each frequency, there will be two lines, and we average over those two points. And that gives us what we call the stimulus dependent part. Okay? But we can also do the, the uh, other way around. We can say, okay, let's subtract these two parts, but now we average out the stimulus. Okay? So again, we go here at every point and we say, well, you know, there are uh, six stimulus frequency for each decision, so we average over those. Okay? And that gives us then the decision dependent part. And then there will be something left which will be depending on the stimulus and the decision, whatever you couldn't basically capture with this averaging procedure, and that's the interaction-dependent part. And I kind of explained it in this sequential way of subtracting something, because that's in the end what you do, but it's important to notice um, that the decomposition is unique, so it doesn't depend on the order in which you do things. Okay? There's a unique set of formulas that describes it. So you do this for neuron number one, and then you do it for neuron number two, and then you do it for neuron number three, and four and five, and for all the neurons in your uh, data set. You do exactly this decomposition. And then here is what basically uh, DPCA does compared to uh, PCA. So basically in the end you're going to look at this condition independent part, at the stimulus part, the decision part, and the interaction part separately. Because looking at them combined or separately is the same thing, so separately is easier, easier so that's what we're going to do. So let's just focus on the stimulus-dependent part, this one here. Um, so the goal of DPCA will be to go from the original data, okay, find a decoder that projects everything down, and then map everything back up so that you can reconstruct only the stimulus-dependent part. Okay? So that's what's different to PCA, because in PCA you're just trying to reconstruct the whole data. Here, what we're going to do for this particular, for the stimulus, we're only going to try to reconstruct the part that depends on the stimulus. Okay? And so if you do that, you build this readout or decoder to map things down. That then gives you what we call the DMIX stimulus component. And then you have an encoder that maps things back up. And then here in the middle, you now, now find the components using reduced rank regression that basically allow you to do so, okay? And in this case, these are uh, the two main components that allow you to basically go from here to there. And so the goal of DPCA is to basically uh, minimize this distance. So this is the reconstruction, and that is the stimulus-dependent part that we uh, extracted from the data, okay? So this term, this reconstruction term, should be as close as possible to the stimulus-dependent term. And just as in PCA, the more components you have, you know, the better it gets. Okay, but you can sort them, you know, by how much variance they explain in the end, um, and that's usually what we do. Okay, and so now we'll go to the exercises. Um, so for those of you who are still doing PCA, I think I would strongly recommend to finish the PCA exercise first. Um, because nothing is going to get easier with DPCA, okay? And I think it's good to have gone through it once, and we'll, uh, Sander and I will walk around and help you. And then for those of you who are already finished with uh, PCA, um, we're just going to like uh, let you jump into the cold water. So you can again start with this data in this mat file, romoallpsdh.mat. Then I would recommend to read the help uh, for this function dpca.m, which is also on the JIT, so the JIT has the MATLAB version of the DPCA package. That's also Python version, by the way, but it may not be on the JIT. It would be on GitHub, though. So we, you have to maybe download it from GitHub. And Sunder is the expert on the Python version. <laughs>
And the MATLAB version is more plug and play, and the Python version is more hardcore. Right, so uh, the Python people will be more challenged, basically. Um, and then what you basically have, what we'll ask you to do is to first just separate time from condition. So ignore the fact that there are frequencies and decisions, okay? Just say there are 12 conditions and there's time and that's what you're going to try to separate, okay? Just time from condition. Um, and then you can basically, you know, try to get this and plot some uh, plots. And for those of you who managed to do this before 12 o'clock, then there'll also be the uh, challenge of reorganizing the data matrix such that the conditions get separated into stimuli and decisions, okay? And then the explanation of what all of this means, I'll provide at a quarter to 12. Well, no, 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 wait a second. I'm not going to provide the explanation for all of what all of this means. I'm going to provide what we think all of this means, okay, at a quarter to 12. So sorry if I promised too much. So many of you have sort of managed to go through the TPCA and generate some plots, um, both in MATLAB and Python. So the MATLAB, for the MATLABs, I have a solution. For the Python people, you have to coordinate because you s some of you have plotted it, so the solutions are there. So if you want the solution, you have to kind of like ask your neighbors. Some of you had solutions. Um, for the MATLAB plot, there's a fo file called romodpca1.m, okay? that does this task that I gave you in terms of separating out, you know, uh, the condition or the category uh, in terms of stimulus and decision from basically the time or condition independent component. Um, and this is kind of like a stripped down version of uh, the code, basically. So you combine these parameters, many of you did that in terms of, you know, uh, stimulus, stimulus plus time, and then this is time, call it a category and category independent. And then there is this problem that many of you bumped into that, you know, uh, DPCA can overfit the data because underlying DPCA is a regression problem, reduced rank regression, and regression tends to overfit in these very high dimensional spaces. And there are two ways of regularizing this. So one is by just turning on a regularization parameter, lambda, and I think I recommend it for most of you to just do that. Another way of regularizing it is to say, well, you know something about the noise in the data. Okay, because you know something about the PSDHs, they were computed as means, but you don't just get a mean if you compute a PSDH, you also get a variance. Okay, so you know how noisy your PSDHs actually are. And you can use that noise, which is called C noise here, it's a matrix, as a way of regularizing DPCA as well. Um, and then if you run that, you get this type of plot that I think many of you had. I guess it's not super fast. And then there's also code called Rumo DPCA2, which separates out the stimuli and the decisions. Okay, so then you have the thing that is more or less uh, what we did in the paper, except it's only for one of the monkeys. So in the paper, we actually have the two monkeys. Okay, so that's why it's going to look a bit different from uh, the paper, because you only see one of the two monkeys. Now, if you use the two monkeys and you separate out stimulus and decision, then this is basically what you get. So that's now our representation of the data. Um, so here you have the task, first stimulus frequency, delay for three seconds, then the second stimulus frequency. And we separate out basically these condition independent components. And these are actually 12 lines that just lie on top of each other. Okay? And kind of means there's a lot of activity that is just related to the rhythm of the task. And that actually dominates the overall activity in the prefrontal cortex. So you see that here, these are the different uh, components. This is the variance that each component explains. And you see the first four components they're all condition independent. So gray here is condition independent. Okay, so they don't tell you anything about the either the stimuli or the decisions. Then component number five is the first one that has some information about the task, in this case about the stimulus. And component six is the first one that tells you something about the decision. And the interesting thing here is that you can actually read out the stimulus information separately from the decision information. Okay? So that there are, even though everything was mixed on the level of single neurons, once you look at the population, you can separate these two different bits of information again. Then we applied this method to many data sets, but actually first I want to say, you know, these condition independent components, what do they correspond to? And one possible explanation, it's usually not super popular with my experimental colleagues, but you know, I guess as a theorist I kind of like it, is to imagine that, you know, you have this manifold uh, where the firing rates change, 
And there's some directions along this manifold that you control experimentally because you present a stimulus, you measure the decision of the monkey, etc. But there may be all kinds of other directions that you actually do not control as the experimenter, say like the breathing, whatever else the monkey experiences. And anything in that sense that is task locked, okay, that will in some sense, even if it's weak, vary with the timing of the task, will show up in these condition independent components. Okay? Then another thing that you can do is really just a visualization. So you can think of this, these are the three stimulus components that we extract. That's one way of looking at them. But you can also, you know, think of them as trajectories. So this is the uh, same information now plotted as a, you know, as trajectories over time. So there was the F1 axis, now there's the delay period. These are the six different stimuli. And then when the second stimulus frequency comes on, it moves along this axis, okay? So the different ways of visualizing the data. I think the main reason I want to show something like this is because yes, you get these components, okay? But it's really still just one way of visualizing the data. And I would always guard against, you know, just fixing on one way and that's it, okay? It's important to look at your data in many different ways. Then we analyzed some other data. I'm going to point out this one because I think it has some uh, interesting uh, uh, there's some interesting results about the interaction terms. So here we analyzed an olfactory discrimination task in a rat uh, from the uh, lab of uh, Zach Mainen in this case. Um, and what the animal basically has to do is it sniffs in an odor port and it sniffs one of two odors, A or B. Okay. If it's order A, it has to move to the left. If it's order B, it has to move to the right. And then it gets a reward. Okay, so that's the task. It's a freely timed task, which provides, you know, extra problems because every trial has a different timing. So there are different ways in which you could handle DBCA in this case. You could just say, you know, I cut the data around the different events of the task. We did something more radical. We kind of restretched uh, each trial to align it properly, okay? turns out that it doesn't really matter which way you do it, you more or less see the same thing. So we restretch the task. So here's the order port, then uh, there is the movement period, and then the animal goes into the reward port, there's a bit of an anticipation period, and then you basically uh, get the reward or you don't get the reward, depending on whether you got it right or not. Okay? And again, just as in the data from Renolfo Romo, you see that the main components here are actually not related to the parameters of, you know, the uh, olfactory, this, the, the smell, or the decision of the animal, they're just related to rhythm of the task, okay? Then here, you have basically information about the stimulus, so the olfactory stimulus, um, and here you have information about the decision. The decision, of course, is the animal moving to the left or to the right, so those are, uh, it could just also just be movement, in fact, okay? It could just be the animal moving left or animal moving right that you basically see here and you have these higher order components. Now the interesting thing is that you also find a huge interaction component um, where basically in this interaction component you know you have certain stimuli and decision going up and other stimuli and decision going down. But now this is a deterministic rewarded task. So if you uh, know the stimulus and you know the animal's decision you actually know whether the animal is going to get reward or not. And it so happens that actually what this interaction component then just extracts are the rewarded condition. And interestingly, you see that its timing uh, happens exactly at the point when the animal is getting the reward. Okay, so actually then in this case, the interaction component is not truly an interaction between stimulus and decision, it's just the reward that the animal is getting. So there's a separate axis in the population activity space that actually now lets you read out whether you get a reward or not. Okay? Then one of the things you, that I find is sort of good about these dimensionality reduction methods in general is that they also allow you to compare things you know, across tasks, across animals, etc. So one thing, for instance, we did is um, we took another uh, data set from the Mainen lab where they changed this task in the sense that the animals did not have to discriminate two odors, but they had to categorize a mixture of odors. Okay? So there would not just be order A and B, but there would also be mixtures of A and B, and the animal just had to decide which of the two was stronger. And this is what you find. Okay, so here are the different uh, uh, odor uh, categories in this case, odor uh, strength. So odor right, odor left has different mixture ratios, and then left and right choice, depending on uh, left or right choice, we have solid lines or dashed lines, and these are the components you find. Okay, and here we just show that we reproduce something that uh, 
that Kepich et al. had found uh, about confidence in this task. But what I just want to show you is that, you know, even this is a different task in different animals, it is sort of surprising that the components don't really change that much. Okay? So the only thing that changed is that the, that the type of stimulus uh, uh, changed, okay? But I would say that there is a surprising overlap in the overall am amount of components you have, okay? And so that is one of the things. One could try to quantify it then, but that is one of the advantages of these, you know, dimensionality reduction methods. You get a quick view of, like, the whole data set, and you can then easily compare, you know, across animals, across, uh, if you change the tasks, etc. Now, one of the questions I got earlier was, okay, so, but what does this all mean that we have these linear readouts? Um, which apparently I'm not quite answering quite yet. But the one more point I wanted to point out, because I think I said that already earlier, you can look at the distribution of encoding weights. So if you look at each neuron, you know, how much does it participate in each of these uh, components? And that is basically shown here for the four tasks. And it's sort of curious that you get these very similar distributions in all cases. And they're all sort of, you know, exponential tails on both sides. Okay? So for the task where we've looked at, we've never found any kind of categories of neurons. We have like decision neurons or stimulus neurons, anything like this. We always find these distributions, and the distributions have always this sort of Laplacian shape. Okay? Which is sort of a curiosity that, you know, I, at some point, I guess we'll have to explain why does it look like this, given that it reoccurs in many different tasks. Maybe the explanation is trivial, right? But still, we need one. Okay, so what does this all mean? So here's a sort of simple schematic of what this could mean. Um, so imagine you have something like a feed-forward network. You know, there's some signal that goes in. Could be something like, a, you know, a visual stimulus, or maybe in this case, a somatosensory stimulus. And then here's your first layer of neurons, second layer of neurons, third layer of neurons, etc. Could be a lot more layers. These days, people like lots of layers, okay? So this would be a standard feed-forward network. Now, a feed-forward network can also be understood as a visualization of what's happening in a recurrent network. The only thing you have to think about is that this is not layers, but this is time. So this will be at time step one, and then all the activity of your neurons basically uh, uh, influences the activity of the whole network one time step later, which then influences the activity of the whole network one time step later. Okay? This is to illustrate that sometimes people say, well, a recurrent network is like a feed-forward network unrolled in time. Okay? This is just to show that like with this little graph, I want to both illustrate what happens in feed-forward networks, but I also want to illustrate what can happen in recurrent network. Okay? Now, if you remember the picture we had for DPCA, it's like you project the data down and then you move it back up. Okay, that's what we did. So let's take that literal for a moment and think that actually the brain is working this way. Then this would be the way it basically works. What you'd have to think about is that these connections here are sort of low rank connections that project things down and then move them back up. The way you do F times D in DPCA. Okay? And what that means is that you actually now go from, if you think about it as a feed forward network, you go from one layer you project things down into, this, into these subspaces that don't have any kind of physical realization, okay? realization. They're just subspaces that we extracted from the data. And then from these subspaces, you project things back up. And then you project things back down, and you project things back up. Okay? So this would be the way in which you would now have to understand what is going on in the network. Okay? If we take you know, these dimensional reduction methods such as DPCA literal, and these different components here, they could be like the stimulus components, the decision components, etc. Okay? And what it then fundamentally says is that there's another way of looking at what the network computes, which is not to go from one layer of activity to another layer of activity, but rather to jump from node to node, from these uh, compressed subspaces to the next compressed subspace to the next compressed subspace. Okay? Because that is then the actual computation that the system is doing. Right? It's not the actual neurons that show you what the computation is. It's what's going on in these subspaces that show you what the computation is. One thing that we did, so one thing that you could also think, well, if this is not a recurrent network, but is a feed-forward network, then shouldn't you be able to see that if you record from one area and another area? Okay? Let's say there's one area here and there's another area here. Shouldn't there be a bottleneck between the two areas? Okay? And in a paper that actually just happened to come out today, so it's a bit of uh, self-advertisement, that's exactly what we did. Okay? We call it the communication subspace. 
that will be the subspace along which two areas, brain areas, commu uh, communicate. So say from, in this case it was from V1, so the Utah array recording from V1, something like 100 neurons, and then tetrad recordings in V2 in the monkey, and we basically use reduced rank regression to predict the V2 activity from the V1 activity, and we did find that there's a bottleneck in the middle. Okay? Yeah? The bottleneck? Well, if physiologically, it's, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have a direct physiological representation because it's a linear readout of the neurons. But you could imagine that like the next layer, I mean, that's what it does. It has linear readouts because in the, in the, like as a first approximation to what a neuron does, you could say you know, it passively integrates uh, the spike trains that are arriving on a synthetic tree. Um, and then what this basically says is that there's a specific way in which these readouts are organized such that there actually effectively is this uh, low rank uh, bottleneck, okay? How can we compare them? That I didn't tell you. I didn't tell how to compare them. The only thing I said is that if you have a trajectory in this subspace and then there's another one in this subspace and in that subspace, that's the computation that the system is doing. That was my claim, okay? My, our interpretation of the data. But I don't tell you, you know, how you're going to extract the computation. You know, that's up for future research. Yeah, I didn't tell you that. I just said, you know, I just claim that's the computation. That's one way of interpreting why you find these low-dimensional subspaces. Here's another way, very quickly, to sort of show why that could be an interesting type of scheme. Imagine that you had like some source area, such as V1, and then it projects to two target areas, our target area A and target area B. So one problem that you're going to face in the, in the brain is how do you actually, you know, separate information that flows to A from information that flows to B, okay? because you don't want to send everything to both areas. So if you imagine, for instance, that an, uh, a neurons in area A and area B, so the B neurons are shown in red here, and the A neurons are shown in green, that they basically read out different directions of the space of the source activity. Okay, so this is the space of the source activity, and each neuron reads out a different direction. So if they just, you know, cluster this whole space, then what that mean, what that would mean is, you know, if you vary the source activity, so here's the source activity, you vary it, that both the downstream areas are going to see what's going on in uh, uh, the source area, in this case, okay? Because they read out in all types of directions, you know, the downstream areas, both the green and the red downstream areas, will see activity that was going on in the source area, okay? However, if you assume that you have these low-dimensional subspaces, you could imagine a scheme that works like this, where, for instance, downstream area B only reads out from this subspace, and downstream area A only reads out from this green subspace. And if you have that, okay, so you have different subspaces now between these two areas, then you can vary source activity in a way that only one of the downstream areas actually sees what's going on, okay? So for instance, in this case, we vary the source activity orthogonal to this red plane, and then only the green plane, the green downstream area, actually is going to see what's going on in the source area. Uh, area B doesn't see anything. Okay? Vice versa, if you only vary activity orthogonal to the green subspace, then only the red subspace is going to see anything. Okay? So it's a way of basically, say, routing information between different areas. Okay? Just as another example for why these uh, low dimensional subspaces could be useful. And then, I promise I was going to finish five minutes early. What time is it now? Five to twelve. So this, is, this slide will be very fast. Uh, so we did PCA, there are obviously other methods. There's factor analysis, which uh, Alexa talked about yesterday, Gaussian process factor analysis. There's the idea that you don't just have these latent variables of projections, but you try to fit linear dynamical systems to them. Okay, they're sometimes called latent dynamical systems. There are also nonlinear methods that people already asked me about it. Nonlinear always sounds fancier. Okay, it always sounds like if you use a nonlinear method, somehow you're doing something be better. But nonlinear methods are actually very dangerous for electrophysiological data because they do not deal very well with noisy data. Okay? They're good if your data is sort of deterministic. But you know, the stuff we record in the brain is very rarely uh, deterministic. And so that is so if you apply a nonlinear method, you really want to know what you're doing, basically. Okay? You really need to understand that method very well. That's my uh, three cents of advice. And so um, that's it. Okay? So, as I said, our best guess for population representations are linear readouts from the population that give us these subspaces. Then DPCA seeks a set of decoders that provide readouts for individual task parameters uh, 
but without losing essential features of the data, so it's representative of what's going on in the data set. It rests on a decomposition of the data into marginalized averages, each of which is fitted to the actual data using a Drew-Strang regression. And then application of the method can highlight similarity across different tasks and across different cortical areas. Okay, thanks. <laughs>